Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The TV show For All Mankind follows an alternate history of the space race, a history where Alexei Leonov becomes the first man on the moon and the US goes all in on developing the Apollo program into something bigger and better. Season 1 ends with a base on the lunar south pole harvesting water trapped in the permanent shadows of Shackleton Crater. And now the trailer for season 2 has dropped and time has moved forward to the 1980s where we see Reagan giving speeches and squads of astronauts with assault rifles. But the thing I want to talk about is a couple of shots of the space shuttle and specifically there's one shot of the space shuttle a long way from Earth possibly on its way back from the moon. And so I want to specifically talk about what it would take to send a space shuttle orbiter beyond low Earth orbit and to the moon. Now the space shuttle was designed to ferry crew and payload only to low Earth orbit and while it was a very capable vehicle for operations in low Earth orbit, it was limited in the maximum altitude it could achieve. I believe the highest altitude a shuttle ever achieved was just over 600 kilometers when deploying and servicing the Hubble Space Telescope. But it was possible for a shuttle to go higher than this, it was just a trade-off with payload versus propellant. However, it not, it's not clear just how much higher it could go since there are a lot of variables involved. So. The standard shuttle would fly to orbit using the solid rocket boosters and the three RS-25 main engines, which run on hydrogen and oxygen that's taken from the external propellant tank. The initial target orbit would be elliptical with a perigee of around 60 kilometers so that the external tank would uh, re-enter quickly after being jettisoned. To keep the orbiter in orbit, the shuttle needed to make a second maneuver in orbit, but it couldn't use the powerful main engines because they didn't have any propellant. Instead, the shuttle would switch over to using uh, the orbital maneuvering system. This was a pair of AJ-10 engines running on hypergolic nitrogen tetroxide and monomethyl hydrazine. The orbital maneuvering system could carry up to 13.5 tons of propellant and it had about 300 meters per second of delta V, which is pretty respectable. The shuttle was quite a capable vehicle while in orbit. So what does the shuttle need to get from low Earth orbit to the moon and then possibly into low lunar orbit and then maybe, hopefully, back to Earth? Well, starting from a 200 kilometer orbit and boosting into a transfer orbit that flies out to the moon, that needs about 3, 3.1 kilometers per second, depending upon where the moon is. But then that will just fly past the moon unless it can slow down there. To capture into a loosely bound eccentric orbit, that's probably another 200 meters per second. And to get into a low lunar orbit from that, that's another 600. So from there, of course, if it then wants to get back to Earth, it will need the 600 and the 200, so that's another 800 meters per second from low lunar orbit to get home. So from low Earth orbit, the shuttle in the trailer would have needed at least 3.1 kilometers per second for a flyby and probably as much as 4.7 for lunar orbit and return. So clearly the orbital maneuvering system needs more propellant beyond what it's designed for. And the good news is that the designers of the shuttle had anticipated that there might be missions where they needed more propellant than could fit in the tanks. So there was a concept of the Ohm's payload bay kit, which would carry extra propellant reserves inside the payload bay. And the shuttles all had the plumbing to hook up the, these tanks and controls to, in the cockpit for them. It was never used, however. So how much extra propellant would we need? Well, NASA documents tell us that the AJ-10-190 engines would get a specific impulse of 313 seconds and the rocket equation says that we need 175% of the shuttle's dry mass in propellant to reach the 3.1 kilometers per second and 360% of its dry mass for an actual low lunar orbit. So for the dry mass of the shuttle, let's just assume 80 tons, but in truth, that's with no payload and not much in the way of other consumables, but that gives us you know, fuel requirements of 140 tonnes and 290 tonnes. The density of monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide in the correct mixture ratio for this is about 1.2 tonnes per cubic metre, so can we fit that in the payload bay? Well, the shuttle's payload bay is 300 cubic meters. That's based on a cylinder 60 feet long and 
15 feet wide. That's a uh, nice and roomy, and while it would be a bit of a squeeze, it would just about accommodate the propellant for both uh, Delta V requirements, which all sounds very neat, but it would never work. First up, it would never get into orbit. The payload capacity of the shuttle was more like 25 tonnes, so you're never going to get it all the way up into orbit if you add hundreds of tonnes of Ohm's propellant to the payload bay. Now granted, there were shuttle concepts that raised the payload mass by changing the launch system, adding boosters, but in the trailer we see a regular space shuttle configuration launching. I might also mention that in the trailer, the black and white tile patterns on this version of Columbia don't match the real one. In fact, it looks like the leading wing edge of the Elevons don't match between the two shots in the trailer. It, look, the point is, we can rule out some super shuttle upgrade that would make it to the moon. Secondly, the Ohm's thrust was really low, so that acceleration to escape velocity or lunar escape would take far too long. They would either have to waste delta V due to gravity losses, or they would have to do it in multiple passes, and that would mean many, many passes through the Van Allen belts, which is not good for your crew. So there are the main engines, which are much higher thrust and much more efficient. And so how about we fill the payload bay with hydrogen and oxygen tanks? Well, Hydrolox is about one quarter the density of the hypergolic fuels. So you're only going to fit about 84 tons into the payload bay, which gives us about three kilometers per second of delta V, barely getting to fly past the moon with a bit of the help from the Ohm's thrusters. And of course, if you fill the entire payload bay, there's no room for payload to take to the moon, which kind of makes the whole thing pointless. So I'm sorry for doing all that math because there's a better solution and one that makes far more sense in the, uh, you know, environment of the TV show. I think that they have to refuel in low Earth orbit and instead of refueling the ohms and filling up the payload bay, they'd simply keep that large external tank and refuel the hydrogen oxygen at the space station. The show talks a lot about water on the moon as a resource, so maybe they harvest it from the moon and bring it down to low Earth orbit, or maybe they just have fuel ferries that are bringing up propellant from the surface of the Earth. If your show is built around having a large base on the moon, having a station in low Earth orbit is well within their technological capabilities. So anyway, the external tank does add a bit of dry mass, but the huge volume would let them put enough propellant in there to perform the entire lunar injection, orbit insertion and departure, and it would leave room in the payload bay to carry useful stuff. I wouldn't try landing it though because those wings are just dead weight on the moon. The RS-25 engines were never started in flight at any point, but they were designed uh, to need nothing more than pressure of the propellant and electrical power to start up. So in combination with the knowledge burn from the Ohm's thrusters, there's no real reason that they couldn't be used multiple times in flight. The other technical limitation would probably be evaporation of the liquid hydrogen over a multi-day mission. But the tank has capacity for over 700 tons of propellant, so I'm sure they would just load extra propellant and deal with it. Now, the other option for the TV show might be some kind of space tug. They have a post credit sequence in season one that puts a nuclear powered spacecraft on top of a sea dragon, which honestly seems a bit out of place in the evolution of Apollo to the shuttle, but maybe they want to have a nuclear tug dock with a space shuttle and bring it to the moon. Either way, there's one final problem that affects both possible solutions. The thermal protection system on the shuttle would not be able to handle return from lunar orbit. The total heat load is more than double and the peak heating higher still compared to low Earth orbit. Apollo had a single use ablative heat shield, but the shuttle had to be reusable. And as designed, those thermal protection tiles would need to be a lot thicker to protect the shuttle from a lunar re-entry. The top of the shuttle might be better off being silver as well to reject more of the uh, radiative heat from the plasma trail. Finally, it's worth commenting that the shuttle is showed headed back to Earth and has its payload bay closed. And this is probably a mistake since the shuttle's thermal control system needs the doors open to expose the radiators. However, this system is designed to operate in low Earth orbit where the heat flux is higher, 
as the Earth you know, sort of reflects and re-radiates energy onto the spacecraft, the thermal management in deep space may well be a little different, but I still think the doors should be open. Anyway, taking the space shuttle to the moon is generally a bad idea because the shuttle has so much extra mass for systems that aren't useful at the moon, things like wings. But hey, it's just a TV show and it's set in an alternate history and is clearly interested in iconic images and ideas that get the audience excited. And the idea of the space shuttle going to the moon probably makes a lot of people interested, uh, although I think a lot of people are also interested in seeing astronauts with assault rifles. Either way, I know that I'll be watching season two when it's released. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.